Hi, I'm Joe Fagan, and welcome to this edition of Discover West Orange. This monthly program, sponsored by the Downtown West Orange Alliance, is ded dedicated to raising awareness and preserving our rich local history. The town of West Orange didn't yet exist when the earliest settlers first arrived here 100 years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Records indicate that the first permanent settler within the present-day boundaries of West Orange was Anthony Olaf in 1678. At that time, it was an unoccupied wilderness and part of the western section of the original Newark settlement of 1666, which makes up most of Essex County today. Anthony Olaf settled in what would become Llewellyn Park in West Orange nearly 177 years before the park was founded. His farm consisted of 60 acres of land when the whole mountainside was nothing more than a dense forest. Various small game and wild animals such as wolves, bears, and beavers were the only inhabitants. Anthony Olaf died in 1723 at the age of 87, and his grave is the oldest on record and is the first in what is known as the Old Burying Ground. On today's show, we will explore the history where Anthony Olaf is buried and how it is connected to West Orange's own history. The Old Burying Ground is actually two cemeteries in one that includes the lesser known and less visible St. Mark's Cemetery. If not for the unselfish commitment of two West Orange men, we might not even know this place existed. Vincent Damon and Brian Kramer have stepped forward as volunteers and have given generously of their time since 2007 to rescue St. Mark's Cemetery from the brink of oblivion and in the process are restoring and resurrecting West Orange history. The old burying ground sits at the busy corner of Main Street and Scotland Road in Orange and easily conceals its historic surroundings. Here peacefully lie many weather-beaten graves quietly peering through a portal of time from a distant past. Their names on the graves are now forgotten and slowly vanishing into oblivion as tombstones crumble and deteriorate from time and neglect. But thanks to the devoted efforts of two West Orange men, important links to our local history are being resurrected one grave at a time. The old burying ground predates the Revolutionary War and was donated to the Mountain Society about 1718 by Nathaniel Wheeler. The Mountain Society was the name given to the first settlers in the area and were an early part of what became to be the first Presbyterian Church of Orange. But the old burying ground is now practically obscured by the often hectic pace of the 21st century. The, to the untrained eye, it is difficult to see that there are actually two cemeteries here, both with distinctive and interesting histories. The larger and old cem older cemetery belongs to the First Presbyterian Church of Orange. Practically indistinguishable with no real boundary of demarcation until installation of a chain link fence in recent years, is the second and smaller cemetery. A plot of land adjacent to the Presbyterian Church burial ground is the graveyard for St. Mark's Episcopal Church located in nearby West Orange. St. Mark's Church was built in 1828 and purchased the land for their graveyard in 1842. Since then it has been used continuously for burials until 1955. However, due to financial hardships and decreased membership beginning in the 1960s, it began a downward spiral. The St. Mark's side of the old burying ground subsequently fell in disrepair, plagued by both neglect and vandalism and lack of financial support for upkeep. It was well on a path to total obscurity. In 2004, Vincent Damon was the head deacon of the Lamb of God Fellowship and began renting the vacant St. Mark's Church. What had been intended to be a long-term stay was facing an uncertain future by 2007 due to the high abstainable maintenance costs of the church property and utilities. It was around this time when Vince first learned that St. Mark's had a cemetery in nearby Orange. 
He attempted to lower his rent by agreeing to clean up the neglected and forgotten cemetery owned by the church. This lasted for a few years, but by 2009, it simply was no longer possible to continue running the church. However, despite no longer being able to rent the church, Vince received permission to continue restoring the cemetery and was joined by Brian Kramer. The two men have been there ever since, and for them, restoring St. Mark's Cemetery has become a deeply devoted labor of love. For further clarification, I'd like to show you a map exactly what the area is, what we're talking about. You can see here that this, is, uh, this map represents Main Street uh, and Northfield Road at the bottom of Northfield Road in West Orange. And um, the old burying ground is located just over the Orange-West Orange border uh, on the corner of Scotland Road and Main Street. And certainly St. Mark's Church has been a landmark in West Orange for many years. That's located uh, right at the bottom of Northfield Avenue. In 1842, uh, St. Mark's purchased a portion of the old burying ground uh, as their cemetery. Uh, normally, uh, you would expect to see graves from a church next, uh, graves from the church directly next to the church. That's not the case with uh, St. Mark's. It has been used from a gra for, as a graveyard from 1842 to 1955. Uh, and in 1928, the church that is currently uh, the, uh, the First Presbyterian Church at the corner of Scotland Road and Main Street, uh, that was relocated from a previous location following a fire there, and it was uh, built there in 1928, and graves were actually taken out of the old burying ground and uh, relocated in Rosedale Cemetery. Uh, what I have here is actually an old record. Uh, this was given to me by an old church record from the First Presbyterian Church. This was given to me by Bob Reed, uh, the former church historian. And uh, on this record, it actually mentions that the first person in the uh, old burying ground was Anthony Olaf. Now, Anthony Olaf's name is actually spelled Olive, but it's pronounced Olaf. And uh, there, I have seen uh, other variations uh, of the spelling of his name, but it's generally believed that his name is pronounced Olaf. Uh, this is a picture of his original grave in the old burying ground, uh, but it has been changed in 1969 at the 250th anniversary of the church, and this is, uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, in West Orange, there is no uh, monument or street named for Anthony Olaf today. However, on a 1904 map, I have found that uh, off of Rollinson, there's two streets, uh, Pilat and um, Nutman Place. And in 1904, there actually was an Olaf uh, Place. Uh, that name has since been changed and is today's Osborne Place. Here's a picture from about 1908, and it uh, shows what the old burying ground looked like from uh, the perspective of Scotland Road. And uh, to the uh, left in the picture is David Pearson. He's the uh, orange historian. And uh, he realized in 1908 that the old burying ground was in, in, in bad shape. And uh, he decided to, to undertake a project to uh, restore the old burying ground. And uh, this is 1908. And this is the, uh, what it looks like today, almost the same camera angle from the same location. Here's another 1908 picture of the corner of Scotland Road and Main Street, and you can see workmen uh, at the corner uh, working on the wall. And this is the close-up view of the, uh, of the workmen. This is what the, uh, what, the corner looks, what the corner looks like today. I'd like to make two announcements before we take a break. Uh, Save the date, Saturday, June 7th, uh, 2014, is going to be the West Orange uh, Street Fair downtown. It's actually going to be part of the uh, 350th anniversary of New Jersey. And the West Orange Downtown Alliance, the West Orange Chamber of Commerce, the Town of West Orange, and the Thomas Edison National Historical Park are all going to partner, partner together to make it a, uh, a day-long event. There's going to be music, entertainment, uh, history, uh, vendors, uh, food, refreshments. It's going to be a great day. It's still in the planning process, uh, and we'll have further announcements as, uh, as developments become available. Uh, but save the date, Saturday, June 7th, 2014. 
And also I'd like to announce that uh, in May 2014, I will have a new book coming out, uh, Stories of West Star Orange. And uh, this, this will give you a new perspective uh, on West Star Orange and the many stories. Uh, certainly Thomas Edison is an important part of West Star Orange, uh, but there's so much more to uh, West Star Orange than just Thomas Edison. More information can be found on the website westorangehistory.com. And I also want to mention that any previously aired show of Discover West Orange, uh, the YouTube links are also available there at westorangehistory.com. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we return from break, we'll be joined in studio by uh, Vince Damon and Brian Kramer to hear firsthand about their ongoing work at St. Mark's Cemetery. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Megan Brill, Executive Director with the Downtown West Orange Alliance. We're very excited to be sponsoring Joe Fagan's TV show, Discover West Orange. We hope that you'll learn something more about Main Street and come back and enjoy some of the great things we have to offer downtown. We're joined in the studio by Brian Kramer and Vince Damon, and these are the two guys that have been uh, restoring St. Mark's Cemetery. Uh, Brian, I'd like to start with you. Now, you're an architectural designer by trade. Um, what can you tell us about the architect of St. Uh, Mark's Church? Well, we know that uh, the church started in the early 19th century, sometime around 1828. The first building went up, but um, the building was renovated and added on to, uh, from what the plaque says, 1861. And it's thought that Richard Upjohn was the architect uh, who designed the, the renovation, who was, of course, the great uh, American architect of the time, late 19th century. He did Trinity Church in uh, Lower Manhattan, down by World Trade Center, and uh, quite a lot of other Gothic Revival churches up and down the East Coast, uh, similar to St. Mark's. So it's a significant church uh, architecturally. Is that the official style that St. Mark's Church in is Gothic Revival? I would call it a Gothic Revival. Or brown, it's really a brownstone revival. And I might add that this uh, brownstone was uh, quarried locally here in West Orange. Uh, Brian, what are some of the distinctive features of St. Mark's Church? Well, uh, architecturally speaking. Yeah, I th of course, the, the steeple is probably the thing that people most recognize. Uh, sitting at the corner of uh, Main Street there, where it turns north and into West Orange, and sitting up on the hill, uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a style of of Gothic revival that goes back to English Gothic and uh, translated into brownstone material, which is uh, you know a local material, not what we what, what they would have used in Europe, but it's what they used here in the East Coast around New York area because of the, what we find here just in the hills around West Orange. They probably came down from the, the first mountain there, uh, quarried from there. Now, was the steeple part of the original construction of the church, or was that added in the 1861 renovation? I think that's from the 1861 renovation. 1861 renovation. renovation. Yeah. Now, um, here's a, a, sh a side view of, uh, of St. Mark's Church. And often people ask me uh, about the West Orange train station, uh, not to get off the subject, but uh, I always tell them it was ne next to St. Mark's Church, and uh, it was located approximately right here. Uh, and the uh, Erie Railroad in West Orange will be the topic of an upcoming show. Um, Vince, uh, what we're looking at here, this is the original cornerstone of St. Mark's Church. Uh, yes. when, was the, when was the church uh, uh, built? Uh, the original structure was built in uh, 1828, and based on what we've seen when we were inside in the basement, it was probably a lot smaller. Uh, the, the current structure that you see probably was much, is much larger and would have covered the footprint of the original one. So is this, uh, this cornerstone, it looks like it's actually located on the outside of the church yeah. uh, because of the, uh, the green moss there. Yeah. And uh, there's another cornerstone here uh, marking the, uh, the remodeling that was done in 1861. Uh, where is this located in, in reference to the other one? It's, it's located in the same area. It's the, actually the rear side of the bell tower. The, real, the rear side of the bell tower. Yeah. Now, uh, I often like to point out that the church steeple that we see there at St. Mark's, uh, that's actually the same steeple that Civil War veterans uh, uh, would have yes. known would, would yeah. have known in, in their day. Now, um, unfortunately, the church is closed, and we don't get to see the uh, beautiful interior. And you've mentioned to me in prior discussions that there's a really a lot of history inside the church. Oh, a tremendous amount. Uh, what are we looking at here? 
This is uh, some stained glass windows, and there's a lot of them in there, of the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Luke, Mark, Luke, and John. And then on the right is a baptismal font that's uh, it's quite elaborate. And when does that, how, what, when does that font date back to? How old is that font? Oh, I, you know what, there's no date on it, so we, re we really don't know. Now, uh, let's get to the actual work that you do. And as I've mentioned earlier in the program, that the old burying ground actually consists of two, um, two cemeteries. And, you, and when you look at the corner of Scotland Road and Main Street, you don't see two cemeteries. In fact, you actually have to walk in the driveway to right. see this section here. Uh, and you actually have to walk down the driveway to actually see this sign uh, that there's a historic St. Mark Cemetery. Now, this sign, you've only added this sign in the last couple of years. Well, actually, the, the Episcopal Diocese put that up uh, about 2009. Now, uh, you've also mentioned to me uh, that one of the biggest problems that you have at the cemetery is dealing with trash, and I can't understand why you have that problem. It's, <laughs> it's clearly posted here, please do not put trash in the cemetery. Um, but you, you've said that that's an ongoing problem. It's and, an ongoing and when problem. you first got involved here, uh, you said that this has been like a garbage dump. Tell me what, yeah, what's going on there. For, for many years, the, the cemetery was, uh, it wasn't taken care of. It was overgrown. You had weeds that were quite high. Um, before there was a fence up, which was sometime in the early 2000s, um, local contractors used to back their trucks up and dump, dump construction debris. So you had, a, you had a couple of different types of trash. You had construction debris, and then we, you have what's known as walk-by trash. People will be walking down the street, down Main Street or down the driveway, whatever they got in their hand, it goes over the fence. So the, that, the, the uh, regular walk-by trash is something we have to do every single time we're there. Um, the construction debris, we started to hauling away a truck load at a time. And since 2008, we, we have to have taken away 100 truckloads of various types of construction debris and got rid of it. And we're, we're getting down to the end. There's still some nascent debris left, which is a little bit harder to get rid of. But um, but there's always there's always there, trash. There, there's, that you're there's always some trash to pick up. You're always finding trash. It's hard to believe that people will just dump trash in the cemetery, but they do. We pick up beer and whiskey bottles all the time. Total lack of disrespect. Yep. Now, um, I, I should mention you guys are, are undertaking this uh, uh, restoration. Uh, at your own expense and your own time. <laughs> That's but, true. But you're actually there with permission. You have permission yeah. from, uh, who actually grants you permission the, to be there? The, the cemetery is actually owned by the property trustees of the Episcopal Diocese of Newark. And our, our contact guy is their property manager, Jim Caputo. And he knows, he's, he knows we're there and we have permission to be there and he trusts us that we're doing what we said we're gonna do. And, and it, he likes it because we keep an eye on the place. If you show your face and they see you, People are less likely to, to dump things there because there's somebody watching the store. Well, uh, so it's not that you guys have just walked on here and decided to do that. Uh, no. You, you have the authority to be yeah, there. Yeah, we have permission. Now, uh, you also mentioned to me that um, I asked you today to bring in a couple of artifacts, and you said that you know, you'd love to bring in a tombstone uh, because there's <laughs> many of them, but they're actually pretty heavy, and I guess you, it's easy to lose focus on that. And you can see in the picture here that you're actually wearing a back brace because these things are, <laughs> yeah. are, are pretty heavy. heavy and you have to uh, actually stand these up to get them back in, 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 in their position. Now, you've mentioned to me that one of the biggest uh, assets you have at the cemetery is a heavy rain because when it rains, uh, it washes away. Uh, and, and, and what are some of the things that are uncovered after a heavy rain? Well, we, we have this saying that uh, Rain is good for graving, and we call what we do graving. And uh, as it rains, it, it washes away uh, dirt and leaves and uh, things that have been gathered on top of headstones that have disappeared. And, and people will say to you, well, well, what do you mean? What do you mean they disappeared? Where did they go? Well, what happens is as the ground gets soft over the years, they topple. Sometimes they're toppled as a result of vandalism. But because they're heavy, uh, the weather changes, the ground is moist, you have mud, and the weight of the stone causes it to start sinking into the ground. And before you know it, it's gone. It's just covered up with dirt and leaves and brush. So when you have a heavy rain, a lot of times it'll wash away what's on top of that stone and you'll see a little tiny white speck. And we'll go over there and brush it off. And the first thing you know, you got a, a headstone that's five feet long and we get it up and try to stand it up. And then we see who it is we found. And, 
we quickly uh, rush home to our cemetery book and try to find out who it is. Of course, uh, since there's been no active, active burial there since 1955, there's no family members showing up wanting to know where their loved ones are. Uh, so you don't really see many people there looking for graves, but you've been contacted via the internet. Uh, uh, people looking yeah. for uh, for their descendants. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, we had a gentleman recently named John Bonner that uh, lives in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and uh, he saw our Facebook page. Uh, he contacted us, and he's trying to find out information. His his grandparents, his great grandparents, and his great great grandparents are buried there. So the great grandparents, we actually knew where the headstone was. So uh, we took a picture, we sent it to him, and he was very very appreciative of that. And uh, we've been looking for the great parent, the grand, great grandparents, and the great great grandparents. But uh, time has uh, done a job on them because we, we haven't found them. We know where they are. We have some maps of the cemeteries, and we've poked around as best we can. We ha we haven't found them. We may look again. Now you've showed me these maps before, and uh, they're actually uh, pretty detailed. So you have an idea of what the cemetery should look like. That, right. But what it does look like and what it should look like are sometimes true. Uh, two different things. Now, um, one thing that's present at the cemetery today, uh, if you go there, you'll see a lot of these American flags. And uh, these are actually Civil War veterans that you've, yeah, uh, that you've found right. and yeah. that you've researched. And uh, these flags, uh, you make it a point to, uh, to put these flags on the graves of the Civil War veterans. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, Brian, uh, the Civil War veterans that you found there? Well, we found, uh, what is it, we've found uh, over 20 of them. It, yeah, that, that we know of. Yeah, there's actually the, the records uh, for the cemetery indicate there's 40 Civil War veterans connected with the cemetery, and that that broke down into a little a few different categories. We found 22 of them. Of those 22, uh, we were able to replace 13 of them by contacting the Veterans Administration, and they replay, they supplied us with uh, replacement headstones because the originals had worn out. Um, five of the veterans, the families moved them to other cemeteries, and uh, two of them, they're actually plot owners, but they're not buried there. And there's still another 10 veterans that are buried there that we haven't found that we're, we're still looking for. Hopefully in the uh, upcoming uh, yeah. spring right. yep. uh, uh, that you'll be able to locate them. Now, um, you've also mentioned to me that you found bones at the cemetery. <laughs> uh, that's pretty interesting. Can you tell me what the bones that you found? Yeah, I'm surprised you brought that up. It, it is a little bit of a funny story because we're, we're, we're there and we're digging in a cemetery and we're, uh, we're basically looking for headstones that have toppled. Uh, I, we always have this fear that we don't want to be disrespectful and if we found human remains, if we found bones, you know, what are we going to do? So, so one day we're digging and we, f we found some bones. And uh, Brian, being an accomplished artist, uh, looked at it, and we finally realized that, based on the size and Brian's knowledge, it turned out to be a chicken bone somebody threw there. So uh, somebody was just walking by and yeah. tossed a... Yeah, it happened a, twice. We a, found somebody a, threw some spare ribs also. A, so. a chicken bone. <laughs> As, uh, before we run out of time, I just want to get to very quickly, uh, there's also, um, at the back of the cemetery, there's also... Uh, uh, according to your maps, a, a Negro burying, a burial yeah. ground at the back of the cemetery, and uh, you haven't really gotten into that yet, so hopefully at one point uh, that will uh, reveal, some, uh, reveal some of its secrets and uh, perhaps give us some insight on some West Orange history. Now, uh, our viewers at home are probably wanting to know uh, about ghosts at the cemetery. Have you seen any <laughs> ghosts at the cemetery? Um, you've mentioned that you've taken pictures and there's always orbs in the pictures. What, what do they really represent? <laughs> well, well, after a little research, we, we found out that if you use a digital camera and it's a dreary day and uh, it's cloudy, uh, the flash reflects off of water drops if it's raining and it, it gives the appearance of an orb, but it, it's really not. Okay. We, we haven't found any ghosts in the summer. Well, I want to move, move along, Brian uh, and, and, and Vince. and. Um, this is uh, Carol Comfort's book, and uh, she has written a book, and it's a detailed history of all those buried at the cemetery. And uh, I also want to give your contact information here. Uh, you can contact Vincent Bryan at this email address. Now, they're always looking for volunteers. They're always looking for uh, help. 
You're always looking for contributions, and if, and if you feel uh, reluctant to give them a contribution of money, you can always contact Vince and, and purchase them some inexpensive supplies that always come in handy. And uh, Vince also does a uh, newsletter, and uh, you can subscribe to his newsletter for all the latest updates. And finally, uh, as we go, I just want to uh, give you a personal donation here on behalf of the West Orange Downtown Alliance. Oh, wow. And this is an, an, a two-volume index of uh, Civil War veterans from New Jersey. Well, yeah, uh, I know what that is. Perhaps you guys can, can use that in, in your endeavors. Wow. Thank you that, very much. Yeah, that's, well, thank that's you for all item. the good work that you do. And uh, once again, thanks for coming on the show today. Okay, thanks for having and, us. And uh, please uh, continue and keep me posted on, on all your good work at the sure. cemetery. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. If anyone would like to contact the show, you can do so online. Here is my email address. It's very simple to remember, Joseph Fagan, my name, at westorangehistory.com. Or if you prefer the old-fashioned way, you can contact me via the downtown West Orange Alliance at 66 Main Street in West Orange. And, of course, that's the same address as West Orange Town Hall. When you become familiar with Vince and Brian and their work, it becomes abundantly obvious how important and personally fulfilling this work is to them. They talk about the names on the graves they discover with a high level of respect and reverence normally reserved for family members. Then again, in a certain sense, these graves have become like family to them. They spend almost an equal amount of time restoring the graves as they do researching the persons who they find to learn more about their lives. Thanks to their commitment and devotion, they are helping to preserve our local heritage. They are literally leaving no stone unturned in restoring life to the final resting place of the forgotten dead at St. Mark's Cemetery. For the West Orange Downtown Alliance, I'm Joe Fagan, and I'll see you on Main Street.